Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board's meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, the chair of the board, and we're going to start today's meeting as we usually do with the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I am in my car. I'm actually about to go in and get my shot, so um, I'm going to leave the meeting in about 15 minutes and come back in. Um, so just a few scheduling announcements and public comment announcements. I'll start with public comment. As I've said before, we are accepting public comments on a potential next all payer model agreement with CMMI or CMS. And um, the, there's a link on our website under the public comment section. There are some slides that were presented to our general advisory as well as our primary advisory group uh, by the Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS, Ina Bacchus. So you can use those as a reference and then um, please submit those comments and we will be sharing those with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they will be taking the lead in a potential next agreement. And the scheduling announcements are um, next week, I, I think will be a really interesting meeting. We are going to have an intro to the Data Governance Council um, an introduction of the members. We haven't had a chance to have all of you at the Green Mountain Care Board have a direct conversation with that subgroup, the Data Governance Council of the Green Mountain Care Board. So I think that um, will be a really great opportunity for you to get to know them as well as the public. And then we're also going to have a potential vote on the data submission rule. And then there is a prescription drug technical advisory group on April 19th. I see Robin shaking her head member lunge at 2 p.m. I think that's correct. Um, and all of the information to get into those calls are is located on our website. And that is all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. Good luck with the jab. OK, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, April 7th. Is there a motion? So moved. so moved. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Tom to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 7th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. Next, we're going to turn to a discussion of the vital budget guidance. And for that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Sarah Kinsler. Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Strategy and Operations. Um, a few weeks ago, I presented to the board um, some draft annual budget guidance for Vermont information technology leaders. Um, the goals of the draft guidance are to provide clarity to the board and vital about the regulatory timeline and the contents of the budget pa package, as well as clarity around monitoring activities uh, to provide clarity to the board and vital um, about um, about those monitoring activities, both like the, the quarterly updates and the mid-year budget um, to support collaboration between the board staff, um, AHS, DIVA, and vital, uh, and to clarify the board's principles review uh, for review, which have not been updated since 2016. Um, I wanted to report back to the board that we received one public comment about this. The, the comment was um, from vital uh, in support um, of the draft guidance as it, as it was presented. Um, and there were no other public comments, so I'm not proposing any changes um, to what was presented a few weeks ago. Um, if the board would like, I can present, or I, excuse me, I can project the draft guidance for you all now. Um, but I think there there are no other um, there are no other changes that I would recommend. Okay. Do you need a motion from us, Sarah? I do need a motion if you if you are prepared to vote. I, I can make a motion. Go ahead, Tom. Um, I move that we approve the vital budget guidance as presented to the board on March 31st, 2021. A second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there um, further discussions from the board or questions of Sarah?
Hearing none, I'm going to open up the uh, topic um, to the public for public comment. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment? Seeing no hands raised and hearing uh, no response, um, is there any further discussion by the board? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very Thank short, you. very concise. <laughs> Okay, next on the agenda, we're going to turn to um, Act 159 of 2020, Section A, uh, hospital, hospital Sustainability Planning. And I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over at this time to Elena, Elena Barabee. Hello, thank you. Okay, so I will share my screen. Let me know. We can see it. Great. Okay, so this report was submitted to the legislature on April 1st, um, and I will um, kind of pick and choose kind of what I think is the most um, key for us to um, kind of review today. Um, so this is just a reminder, the statute um, asked the Green Mountain Care Board to consider ways to increase the financial sustainability of Vermont hospitals in order to achieve population-based health improvements while maintaining community access to services. Um, you know, as a reminder, the context within which our um, healthcare reform is happening is value-based care. So this slide should um, be familiar to you, thinking about not just cost, but also quality and population health outcomes. With the patient being in the middle. With the patient at the center of that care, absolutely, Chair Mullen. Um, so uh, this slide just, we've used it in a number of um, presentations, but kind of synthesizes um, the commitment of the, you know, federal commitment to making this shift to value-based care. Uh, this really began in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act, um, was kind of reconfirmed with MACRA and, and existed and maintained momentum through changing administrations. Um, and then, you know, has um, been evident as a continued um, pursuit of the Biden administration um, with their most recent change. Um, and in Vermont, we've also seen commitment to shifting away from fee-for-service towards value-based care um, for many years, you know, starting back in the days of Blueprint and then through the SIM grant and um, as evident as well in our all-payer model. Um, and then the Global Commitment for Health waiver also has intersection certainly with the shift to value-based care. Um, so it's, you know, just this is an important context to remember when we're thinking about sustainability. It's really not, um, you know, we're not trying to focus on fee-for-service, but really kind of sustainability in a value-based care environment. Um, so I want to revisit some statutes that may be very familiar to you, but um, wanted to point out kind of um, some additional goals that, you know, are important to consider as we're moving forward in this work. So, you know, the purpose of the Green Mountain Care Board um, was really to improve health of the population, reduce per capita rate of growth and expenditures for health services in Vermont across all payers while ensuring that access to care and quality of care are not compromised. Um, and then enhancing the patient and healthcare professional experience of care, recruiting and retaining high quality healthcare professionals and achieving administrative simplification. So certainly no small feat, but all still very relevant um, to the work that's happening in our state. Um, some healthcare reform principles that um, are, are very salient to this work. Um, you know, I think there were three key um, principles that, that um, are you know, most relevant. So, you know, reducing the overall healthcare cost, so cost containment. Um, item number four is about, um, you know, continued access, particularly in rural areas, um, to necessary healthcare services and that these healthcare services are sustainable. Um, and then principle number 12, that the system must consider the effects of payment reform on individuals and on healthcare professionals and suppliers. Um, it must enable healthcare professionals to provide on a solvent basis, effective and efficient health services that are in the public interest. Um, so taken together, you know, I think we really just, I wanted to highlight here that although we're, you know, we're focusing on hospital financial sustainability, it really cannot be studied um, absent these other policy goals, which are, so tightly intertwined, um, you know, with access and affordability, et cetera. 
So um, some of the Green Mountain Care Board's duties um, that are, you know, um, directly related to this work as well, um, you know, our regulation of innovative reforms that seek to improve statewide performance on cost, quality, and access, as I mentioned before. Um, so we use regulatory levers to contain Vermont's healthcare cost growth, including the development and implementation and evaluation um, of healthcare payment reform, develop and implement a method for evaluating system-wide performance and quality, including the identification of appropriate process and outcome measures, um, identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources um, you know, in the HROP. And then uh, through hospital budget review process to promote the efficient and economic operations of hospitals consistent with HROP, taking into consideration appropriate benchmarks and best practices. Um, so these are things that the board does um, that kind of supports this idea of hospital sustainability planning work. Um, so what are the, you know, again, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Again, as I mentioned, it's not just financial sustainability, but, you know, eroding hospital margins in, and their root causes is certainly one of the key um, goals here. Um, but also, you know, in, in order to ensure that the margins are sufficient, what are we what are we paying for, right? What what is the system buying? So opportunities to improve health system efficiency and to ensure continued access to essential services. We don't want to um, you know, pursue hospital sustainability to the detriment of access. Uh, so these things must be balanced. Um, and then also the unaffordability and unsustainable reliance on commercial rate increases um, as they relate to hospital budgets. You know, I think sustainable or unaffordability is something we've certainly heard a lot about over the, um, you know, over the most recent years and um, continues to be a, a critical problem for Vermonters. Um, and then preparedness for value-based payment. So hospitals cannot continue to rely on volume-centric business models and rely on fee-for-service to catch back up um, and make their, their budgets whole. So how do we kind of prepare our hospital system um, for that shift to value-based payment models? And then um, COVID, so our pandemic, you know, was was really, you know, wasn't the reason for a lot of these issues, but certainly exacerbated and could um, many of the uh, financial um, crises that some of our hospitals were in. So how do we help ensure that hospitals can recover post pandemic um, and not just, you know, in terms of financial um, uh, challenges, but also how do we help being ensure that they can get through their backlog of preventative care and screening that may have been foregone um, during, you know, during the shutdown. So I won't spend much time on the hospital financial measures because I think you know many of these are uh, very salient to you now and the hospital team did an excellent job not too long ago taking you through this. Um, but you know just just as a reminder, you know we've had hospitals. This is not just a Vermont problem. This is a, a national um, issue. But we've you know close to home have also noticed. Um, you know, we had a, a hospital bankruptcy and then the increasing or decreasing um, margins has been certainly troubling. So you know, this work has been ongoing uh, and, as you know, is, is still of a great concern. So plummeting operating margins um, even before COVID-19, where we have expenditures outpacing revenues. Um, you know, and this only got worse, um, as you can see in the rightmost column um, with the pandemic you know, essentially eroding margins down to zero. Um, and operating margins, um, it's not just, you know, one or two hospitals, it's really across the board that we've seen um, these challenges. Um, they did um, get some federal support, but that is, you know, not expected to be ongoing. Um, so I will you know, continue through here, you know, as as I mentioned, the federal support, while that helped, you know, it, it's not a sustainable model to continue to rely on non-operating income. Um, and thus, you know, commercial charges continue to increase. So while, you know, there, we, there may have been some assistance that helped kind of get hospitals through this, um, through this challenging time, you know, commercial rates continue to rise and that is not um, sustainable. So I think it's it's really important to define the work, um, as we've mentioned before, kind of the, the broader context within which we should consider financial sustainability. Um, you know, how can we ensure that hospital revenues or provider reimbursements are sufficient to cover the cost of operating a system that strikes the appropriate balance between efficiency and access in rural Vermont? So, you know, it's certainly important to recognize that in a small state where we have 
um, declining and aging population that is dispersed throughout the state, um, that we, we do have to pay a premium for access in those communities. But how can we um, kind of ensure that we are as efficient and as lean as possible and um, at a system level? So it's certainly possible that we can operate efficiently on the community level, but there may be some opportunity still um, in the name of continuous improvement to continue kind of thinking about creative ways to um, make sure that we have the most efficient system possible and that we're, we're using our, our limited resources um, efficiently in this state. So how can sustainable hospital reimbursement ensure access to essential services for all Vermont communities? How can we ensure the efficient and economic delivery of services and ultimately the improved health outcomes for Vermonters? So the framework, um, this should look familiar to you. I think the, the sections may look a little bit different, but we've um, all of the content is still very relevant and, and similar to what was presented um, uh, last year. So part one is now current state and gap analysis. As you know, we had hoped that this would be a collaborative exercise with the hospitals, and it, and it has been. Um, but I think, you know, due to the pandemic, we've not been able to kind of have that upfront engagement that we were hoping or the depth of upfront engagement. And so, you know, we took a lot of the um, kind of data number crunching in-house um, to see how far we could go and, and anticipate kind of further conversation with our hospital partners as they um, as they um, have some capacity to do so. So this current seat and gap analysis um, looks at hospital financial health, provider reimbursement and variation in prices and costs, community access to essential services and hospital system needs to improve health outcomes of Vermonters, including an assessment of hospital system capacity and quality. Um, so these analyses kind of taken together um, should give us an idea of kind of the challenges and opportunities that may lie across this, across our state. Part two, we really hope to get um, deep into hospital engagement and kind of fleshing out, you know, what, um, what these analyses are pointing to and then further analysis that may be needed to kind of tell the full story. Um, and then part three, uh, we hope that, you know, through those learnings, we can identify some potential paths forward to improve hospital sustainability and preparedness for value-based care, taking into consideration um, those other policy goals, you know, of affordability and access that we discussed earlier. Um, in the hospital financial health, um, you know, we got some great feedback from some of our hospital leadership when we were speaking with them last fall. Um, I think everyone felt that the um, measures and benchmarks that we were discussing were pretty uh, standard and um, were good indicators of financial health. Um, so, you know, once we can kind of package all of the analyses up, we'll ask hospitals to explain the drivers um, of the identified vulnerabilities, any hospital that strategies they already have in place aim to mitigate these challenges, as well as any known state or federal barriers to these um, kind of identified um, vulnerabilities. Uh, so, you know, this we feel pretty good about and already have um, made some significant progress. This is an example of the dashboard um, that was created using hospital financial metrics that we already have access to through the hospital budget review. Um, and so you can see across the bottom there are a number of tabs and kind of groupings of indicators. And it's an interactive dashboard that can kind of give you an idea of how hospitals are doing on these particular measures. Um, and there's some explanation up front about what some of these measures mean. So no single measure will kind of tell you the whole story. It's really about kind of triangulating across different measures. And I think um, both financial metrics and kind of the capacity and quality metrics should be considered simultaneously. And we'll kind of get into that. Um, so some of so the next kind of um, content area in the um, current state and gap analysis is uh, hospital reimbursement and variation in prices and costs. So this section describes um, kind of the business model of the hospital and um, you know, their ability to kind of generate a margin. So the percent of hospital revenue from value-based payments um, and then kind of we've, you know, I think as you've seen in the hospital budget guidance, you're um, getting some more clarity on different kinds of value-based payment programs, one of which we think is um, particularly beneficial that um, you know you all have been discussing at length is the fixed perspective payment, um, which provides stable and flexible um, payment streams to providers that can be kind of um, invested up front rather than waiting for um, 
kind of utilization to occur and, and paying on that fee-for-service basis. So, um, and then cost and price variation by hospital. Um, we hope to look at that by payer, hospital designation, and then inpatient, outpatient down onto the service line, um, as well as a payment to cost ratio by inpatient, outpatient, and kind of the service line level. So this will be new information that um, will get us a better idea of kind of the business operations and, and challenges um, and variation really across our different hospitals and hospital designations. Across the state. This is an example um, of one of those um, analyses. So you'll have kind of groupings of different hospital um, type and then variation um, in cost or price. Across the state. Uh, quality, so access um, and we will also assess the ability of the Vermont Health System to deliver essential high quality services and improve health outcomes um, for Vermonters by assessing capacity and quality. Um, so on the capacity side, we're gonna look at uh, you know, overall occupancy rates for Vermont hospitals relative to peers, trends in ED usage, inpatient admissions, length of stay, uh, and then we'll project the bed needs given you know, some of Vermont's demographic challenges over, um, you know, the time horizon. So these are just some example indicators of the types of metrics we'll be looking at, um, just to get an idea of some trends. And I certainly don't think this uh, preliminary capacity analysis will answer any, you know, all of our questions. We it will it's just kind of a conversation starter to begin to understand the challenges that um, our hospital system faces. So this is an example analysis. Um, you would have the kind of the hospitals across the bottom, each of these bars represents a, a certain hospital and it'll show you, uh, for example, their outpatient emergency room um, rate, you know, compared to the Vermont average, a New Hampshire average, and we have a Maryland average, so some, some peer um, benchmark. And then projected bed need by hospital, um, we're gonna look at, you know, um, you know total, um, Sorry, uh, total days, I've already, I've just been blank, but so you're looking at um, average daily census um, based on historical use and then modeling kind of what the population projections may look like across our um, communities and then what, um, you know, out, you know, a number of years that might look like. In terms of quality, um, we'll look at in hospital mortalities intra-hospital readmission rates, complications, prevention quality indicators, service line volume analysis, among other quality indicators. Um, in this quality section, I'm particularly excited. You heard not long ago from um, VPQ, and um, we're doing some exciting work with them to try to think about how we can um, kind of coordinate across our, our quality frameworks and make sure that, um, you know, this is how we're thinking about quality is in line with the work that's already happening um, in our hospital system and then how we can kind of improve um, and align across quality frameworks. So an example um, of some quality metrics um, from our analysis um, is, you know, in hospital mortalities, you have the hospital names across the bottom and then observed versus expected rates. Um, we also look at intra-hospital readmission rates, which is you know, between hospitals, and that'll be the kind of the first time we, we dig into those kinds of statistics um, using VCURES, which will be pretty interesting. Um, another one is um, this, could, this could be a hospital um, specific dashboard. Um, it has, you know, different service lines in each of those kind of grouped columns, and then the observed and expected um, mortalities for that particular service line. Um, so there's very granular data um, and very kind of aggregate data. And so it, it'll be important to really understand the narrative and, and have discussions about what, what these data might mean and um, how, what we can learn and, and how we can think about um, evolving um, and improving the efficiency and quality of our system. Um, so hospital engagement, um, you know, as I mentioned, we we have worked with hospitals to the extent possible, given given the pandemic and um, their their you know their need to to spend you know spend their most of their time in their community dealing with the pandemic on a daily basis. So um, we did have CFO meetings in December of 2019. So this is before um, you know the bandwidth problem um, arose. Um, and that did inform kind of how this work got started. We had staff presentations and public comment 
February and July of last year, which was very helpful. And then hospital leadership meetings, um, October and November of last year. Um, and we, we received quite a bit of very helpful feedback that influenced kind of where we took this um, project next. Um, and then, as I mentioned, to alleviate the administrative burden, um, we really tried to kind of push this work as, as, as much as we could on our own, giving existing data um, and contractor support. So next steps, and certainly all contingent on the pandemic, um, is you know, we hope to work with hospital leadership to review the analytic methodologies employed in these um, analyses so far, um, continue discussion, discussions with hospital leadership to deepen our understanding of community specific nuances, these early insights, um, and then continue the, our work with BPQ to ensure aligned approach to quality. Um, and then we want to share initial insights and analytics with hospitals um, and ask for their engagement discussion on these to sustainability, potential solutions, and ensure access to high quality essential services and improvements in health outcomes. Um, and then part three, potential pass forward. So, you know, at the end of the day, all of this discussion and this analysis, we hope will point to some um, areas to improve um, hospital sustainability, uh, maintain access to essential services and continue to improve health outcomes um, given this shift to value-based care. So whether and how can we evolve the hospital budget process? Um, are there opportunities to improve other regulatory processes? And what do these insights and challenges suggest for you know, Vermont's proposal for a subsequent agreement um, or other value-based payment models? So you know, we're not anticipating um, kind of directing specific hospital strategies, but rather learning from the challenges that hospitals are facing, the strategies they've employed and they can employ on their own versus where they need kind of a system-wide um, approach and how can we uh, think you know, strategically and system-wide about some of these solutions. Uh, this is just kind of a summary of the timeline to give you an idea. I think we've talked about a number of these timelines. We had our uh, first update to um, the legislature last November. Um, this presentation was the, served as the update for the April 1st first deadline in the statute. And then, um, you know, the, the final report is due back to the legislature September 1st, um, but no later than November 1st, depending um, again on the pandemic. So, you know, it, it still feels tight given that timeline, despite all of the work that we've been doing, but we will continue to kind of go as fast and furious as we can while being thoughtful um, and look forward to um, engaging with our hospitals and communities to continue to learn more and evolve um, this framework. And that is all I have for you today. So I will pause and take questions. Thank you. Good to see you back in the office. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice to be here. So uh, members of the board, um, questions or comments for Elena? This is Robin. Thank you, Elena. I thought very clear presentation and um, it's good to get an update on, you know, where the work is and how it's going. It's um, I'm very interested to see the results and to think about how we can move forward from here. Great. Thanks. I have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> I should remember this, but I don't. Are all 14 hospitals participating in this process or is it just the six? Yes. So actually, I should have paused there on the timeline. Um, you, as a board, voted to extend it to all hospitals, I believe, last budget, hospital budget cycle. So now it is all Vermont hospitals. And uh, just to, not to get into any specifics, but are, are do you get a sense that all the hospitals are uh, in this in a truly collaborative manner? Um, I, I don't want to speak for the hospitals. I think, you know, we did feel that there was a lot of collaborative feedback when we were meeting with them before. I think, um, you know, we have a couple meetings coming up and, and I'm hoping that, you know, we're all going to come with with ideas and with a with with good, yeah. um, good intentions. But yeah, so I, and, I'm hopeful. Well, in fairness, Tom, to them, you know, they've been dealing with the pandemic, so oh, I, it was very difficult to to get, you know, jump head first into uh, this process. So. Yeah. You know, I fully understand that. That's why I asked the question, just because I, I was not up to date as to um, 
you know, is to, to the reaction to both this and the pandemic. And I knew that that was an issue at one point in time. Um, can you go to slide 23, please? Sure. So um, my, my question here is just whether or not um, timing of, of, of variation in prices um, is, uh, are, are kind of aligned because here we have, have this issue um, in the sustainability process, but we also have before the sustainability process was even born, we had a, a price, process internally uh, using V cures and, and discharge data uh, having to do with um, price variation. And I'm just wondering whether or not the two of these are aligned so that, that this process will be informed by our more internal process and that you'll have a very uh, strong database uh, with which to work with hospitals. Because my, my guess is there's a lot of, will be a lot of interest in this area. It could be mm -hmm. controversial. Um, and uh, so I'm just trying to make sure that that uh, two ships aren't passing in the night here. Absolutely. And, you know, we've been working with our hospital or sorry, with our um, analytics team on this. So I think all of the necessary alignment, um, you know, we can we can flesh out, you know, where and I'm not I'm not intimately familiar with the other work. I wasn't on that project, but, you know, we'll make clear, you know, any caveats um, between analyses that may be relevant. But I, you know, I. Um, you know, this is one area that we'll be reviewing with our hospital leadership. Um, this is because it uses claims tells, you know, part of the story, but we um, really want to understand kind of how much of the story this tells. And I think those conversations will be really yeah. important to, to understanding how this data should or shouldn't be used. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, I know that uh, the <clears throat> Auditor Hoffer did an analysis a while back that um, that basically implied that um, the size of UVM Medical Center uh, put them in a favorable negotiating position with with insurers, which may or may not be true. Um, but the price variation data um, in this process and and that independently going on with our analytical team, um, uh, I think will be very valuable to kind of sorting through what's real and what's not there. Yep. And final, finally, I'm just I'm just wondering how structurally that you see this unfolding uh, because this is more than a one year path. Um, and, uh, and so how do we take this initial work and, and boil it down to the essential metrics that we have to look at and, um, uh, you know, structure, structure that in our budget process over the next two or three years, because I, I can't, I, I, I just think it's too much substantively to deal with in one year. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think there's going to be a lot of rich data here for us to consider and to look at and to learn from. But I don't think boy, we will be able to boil it down to any particular metrics. I think what we're hoping is that this will be a learning opportunity to think about um, you know, where we could go next. And I don't know exactly what that looks like because I we haven't kind of done we haven't finished that analysis, right? So, um, but I, you know, we're hoping um, to learn and to to kind of, you know, maybe there are some further, maybe there's further research that needs to happen. Maybe we don't have all of the data we need to be able to answer some of these questions. I think we, some of these metrics may be so helpful that you might want to consider them in your hospital budget process. But I don't, you know, I don't have those answers yet. But I think we're kind of weaving the door open for that learning to happen. Great, thank you, Elena. Other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to the public for public comment or questions. And I'm going to recognize Dale Hackett first. Dale? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. I followed it the best I could while I was also trying to multitask. So forgive me if I ask a question you actually answered. Um, that seems to be the way with Zoom. 
you, you find yourself doing more than one thing at once. Um, especially when you're trying to follow the legislature, too. <laughs> so it sounds too smooth. I'm Unless I'm missing something, because of the pandemic, I see where we're trying to go. Um, and I also know, like with the all care model and the global commitment waiver, those are coming up for renewal. And some of the particulars around that actually have me bothered. I'm wondering how that's going to work out, um, especially if you're talking about apps and you're looking at data about what's utilization. But the pandemic is going to require increased utilization down the road as you try to catch up on services that weren't delivered. That may not be just a six month and then we're back to normal. That could be a year. It could be two years. We really don't know. We don't know how sick people actually are or are going to be from the pandemic. Um, how does that all work out? I mean, I see a future where you may actually be in a year's time be not wanting to cut utilization maybe having to define essential utilization. And if you're running into a cap, you're going to be trying to reduce reimbursement rates and still carry the same utilization. So I, I'm not exa I don't have all of those answers for you, Dale, but I think this is a really important point that we have to consider. So, I, I, you know, the data that we're using is from pre-pandemic. Um, so we certainly recognize that the pandemic added a number of complications to understanding trends going forward. So that's certainly something we'll have to think about. And okay, so it's a work going forward where we really don't know, but we're going to have to find out. Yes. <laughs> okay, next I'm going to call on Ham Davis. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, my question for Elena is that I'm... Uh, one of the things the elements you had in the quality layout the bash, dashboard or whatever you called it was uh i think i many years and i don't think i i'm curious why you're not using the inter-hospital readmission rates because those are the real ones in vermont i've seen this happen a dozen times if somebody has a it needs to be it, it gets a surgery that doesn't work for example and they get it then it doesn't not just small hospitals it involves big hospitals somebody goes to ubm and they get a and they get a bad result they're not going back to ubm they're going to go to dartmouth same thing so my question is my question is that for, especially for surgery the real issue in in admission rates is not intra it's inter and i'm, I'm i just do not understand why we can't see those numbers thank you um, Ham, I'm glad you raised that because I meant I meant to mention that. So we are looking at both inter and intra hospital readmission rates. So we can you will expect to see that. Um, Thank you, Kevin. So Ham, you're breaking up. I'm not quite sure what you just asked. I just want to ask one more question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Elena, the uh, this whole sustainability exercise is obviously very, very important. Um, can you give us a report on when we can likely to see what the uh, two consultants that you have had in the field, they were supposed to report in February. Can, when do we begin to see those numbers? Do you know? Thank you. Um, I don't know. I think we have some preliminary, um, we've had a preliminary look at some of the analyses. I think we want to kind of uh, review that and make sure that we're understanding exactly what that's saying and and what we can and can't say about it. So you know we hope to release it as soon as we can, but I think there's still some work to do there. Um, Thank you. I'm done, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, Ham. Um, next is Kathy Fulton. Kathy. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Mullen, and um, thank you, Elena and team, for the great presentation this afternoon. I just wanted to share two thoughts and um, just really appreciated the detail of the descriptive um, statistics uh, that were uh, presented as part of the draft reporting. 
And I just want to um, add a thought that on the on the flip side of those statistics are some of the realities of the stories and challenges behind those numbers. And what comes to mind are um, you know length of stay and uh, related to you know what could be very um, isolated but challenging and difficult discharges because of lack of facilities and placement sites and appropriate appropriate and safe discharges. So you know one or two challenging cases can really skew the numbers. So it, you know, we're very excited to be working with um, Elena and Michelle and the whole team to um, really understand uh, the, the meaning and some of the interpretation of the data to convert that to valuable information. And really just to reinforce um, along with uh, uh, Elena, I believe you said this earlier, this entire process is are, I think, initial steps in becoming a very strong um, learning health system. And I, I think it may address some of what uh, Dale was saying. You know, we have to go through these probably somewhat painful initial steps and gather in the data, use, um, you know, our, our communications and uh, the strength of our relationships to then convert that data into meaningful information that then can really drive our decisions forward. And as a learning health system, we it's it's wash, rinse, repeat. We keep doing it over and over and over and, and just keep refining the system till we get um, you know, to, to where we feel uh, comfortable and strong in our performance. So thank you for this presentation today. And we can, we look forward to the continuing collaboration. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and thank you, Kathy, for uh the collaboration on your end. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you and, and your team. Other members of the public? Other members of the public? I'm seeing no hands raised, so if anybody has a comment, just speak up now. Otherwise, I'm going to thank Elena for her presentation and uh, know that this work is ongoing and that um, we look forward to um, getting more involvement from the hospitals as we move forward and as we begin to validate some of the information that, uh, um, as Elena said, has uh, preliminarily been prepared. And as Kathy has pointed out, um, there are always more questions and to get to the truth, it's not always black and white. So with that, um, thank you, Elena. And we are gonna move to the next item on the agenda, which is an update on the all payer accountable care organization model agreement implementation improvement plan. That's a mouthful. And we're gonna get that update from Ina Backus from the um, director of uh, health Care Reform for the Agency of Human Services. Ina, welcome and glad that you're here. Hi, thank you for having me. I also would like to introduce my colleague, Wendy Trafton, who's the Deputy Director for Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services and invite her to co-present with me. Super. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Chair Mullen. Thank you for having me. In order to provide an update for the board on the implementation improvement plan, I'm going to use the source document itself, the actual appendix in the implementation improvement plan that serves as the compendium of recommendations that we made. And if it's okay with you, I would share my screen in order to do that. That would be great. I'm, are you able to see what's? I don't see it yet. Does anybody see it yet? How about now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. As you're familiar, because we worked collaboratively 
um, we we to re, to address the um, scale target um, uh, warning that um, we received um, from CMS um, back. Now it's I, I can't keep track in our in our new um, frame of time uh, given given COVID nineteen, but I think it was in the fall. Um, we received we received notification from CMS uh, expressing you know their observation that we had exceeded our scale targets in our all payer model agreement, and we worked collectively both um, through this process of of establishing an implementation improvement plan, but also in providing a response to CMS uh, to detail how we would um, look to improve the, improve the performance in the all pair model. I wanted to make sure if you hadn't discussed it that uh, your audience knows that we did receive a response from CMS that accepted um, our recommendations um, for working to improve to improve scale, um, so that's a that that is a positive development. Many of those recommendations are um, are the same as are here in our in our um, implementation improvement plan. Our first recommendation in the imp implementation improvement plan is to negotiate with CMS to revise the scale targets to reflect real realistic capacity for participation. And in terms of the an update on where we are with this recommendation, um, CMS has has um, in in my estimation indicated that they are that they are willing to come to the table with us to talk about. Um, to talk about a potential modification in this regard. Um, as you also know, they are settling into a new federal administration and settling into some very recent new leadership. And so I would expect that um, hopefully in the near term of this of the spring and summertime that we might be able to have these types of conversations um, more seriously with them. The next recommendation that was proposed was to reduce the Medicare risk corridor thresholds and decrease the financial burden of participation for hospitals in this model. And then your, your staff and, and this board is very familiar with this recommendation um, because of your, of, of your key work in uh, bringing it, um, bringing it uh, to reality and in working with, with CMS as co signatories on this agreement to make this happen and to get this across the finish line. So this recommendation um, has been, has been, um, we have made, uh, we are not in progress on this recommendation, rather we have implemented this recommendation fully. We also um, have requested that CMS establish written guidance or best practices on cost reporting for critical access hospitals. And again, consistent with the CMS um, and CMMI, particularly settling into their new leadership, we do anticipate that we should be hearing something from them on this front. Again, in that near term, um, you know, summer, spring, summertime window. Um, of course, it's going to snow maybe uh, very soon, so we don't. I don't know if it's going to feel like spring or summertime um, in a couple of days from now. Hopefully, it, it still will. Uh, we also we also recommended establishing a path for the Medicare payment model to mirror the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation fixed prospective payments. With this recommendation, and I'll I'd like to say that this recommendation really is emblematic of the frame that we approached the implementation improvement plan from, being that we have seen, um, as you are familiar, considerable participation in the Medicaid program. We have seen quality improvement in the Medicaid program, and we have observed the stability and predictability that the true fixed payment component of the Medicaid program has provided for participants in it. 
And so much of this implementation improvement plan, a theme throughout it is really trying to replicate that success uh, with the Medicaid model in the other payer aspects of the all payer model agreement and implementation. This path for Medicare uh, payment to mirror the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation Fixed Perspective Payment. Our work here, similarly, we need to come to the table with CMS uh, with, their, with their new leadership in place, with CMMI in particular, and discuss this recommendation. Um, certainly, this recommendation is important relative to the implementation improvement plan, which is for this current agreement and potentially for um, a potential uh, possible successor model. So again, um, this is a place where we expect there to be um, some more significant conversation with CMS in the coming months. Recommendation number five, to ensure that the Medicare benchmark uh, provides as much stability and predictability as possible uh, relative um, to 2021 20, uh, and acknowledging the um, uncertainty associated with the pandemic. I think that this work has really been led by your team at the Green Mountain Care Board and that this recommendation could be considered complete at this time. We also, again, want to uh, collaborate with CMS and CMMI in particular in encouraging um, HRSA to prioritize value-based payment for federally qualified health centers. This is a longer term recommendation, but still one that is important to discuss um, with CMMI in the near future as we're talking about how we can really how we can really maximize our performance in this model. And also because there's th there is significant opportunity for participation from federally qualified health centers. And in thinking about how federally qualified health centers, as well as hospital-based primary care and continuing with independent primary care, perhaps are participating in more prospective payment that provides additional uh, flexibility and um, ability for practices uh, to, to better serve their patients. Recommendation number seven is for AHS and the Agency of Administration to conduct education and outreach to non-participating self-funded groups about the benefits of participating in the value-based payment models. The first step we've included, we've and we've um, and we have completed, is um, the outreach and the. Uh, inclusion of the state employee health plan members for attribution to one care in 2021. This, this, that, that portion of outreach is complete. There is more work to do um, for other non-participating self-funded groups. We also recommended prioritizing increasing the percentage. And so here again, you see the mirroring uh, recommendations that are um, that are focused on bringing more of the overall model implementation into alignment with the performance in our Medicaid program. So specifically, prioritizing and increasing the percentage of fixed perspective payments in the VMNG One Care Vermont contract. And we would like to continue to work towards this in requesting that Blue Cross. MVP and One Care identify clear milestones for including fixed prospective payments in contract model design. We've been having some conversations um, with payers as well as with One Care Vermont about what this could look like. Um, we want to continue with these conversations and to and to lay out those milestones. This is an in progress recommendation. Um, and this is a place where um, I think certainly hearing uh, and working with you and your staff further is, is something we would appreciate doing. This next recommendation is one that is um, geared towards the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and I, when, 
perhaps we can have a we can have discussion or or um, you can however you'd like to talk about this. Um, I am interested in in how you might be thinking about this. This is certainly something we can be working on with your staff as well. Um, so the, these recommendations, um, recommendations nine, recommendations ten, um, are specific to the Green Mountain Care Board in looking at how it is gathering um, information from One Care Vermont. And so recommendation ten also asks that the board um, require that One Care Vermont identify the chief cost drivers across this network and detail its approaches to curb spending growth and improve quality. We have also recommended prioritizing the integration of claims and clinical data in the HIE. And we have also organized the HIE so that it is aligned in the Office of Healthcare Reform within the Secretary's office so that we can ideally coordinate and, and ensure that our HIE activities are driving towards this integration of claims and clinical data. We have had discussions about this um, with the HIE Steering Committee. The HIE Steering Committee is um, as well aware of and endorsing the claims integration work that we're beginning with the Medicaid claims data. And from there, we will, we will accelerate the integration of commercial claims data within the HIE as well. This is another key place uh, for collaboration with the Green Mountain Care Board and staff. Certainly as you are um, key users of claims data within the all payer claims database, your experience and expertise in this area is very important as we uh, endeavor further um, with the commercial claims integration and your staff are represented as a part of that process and are participating in the claims pilot. We also recommended partnering with One Care Vermont as well as delivery system users to evaluate the efficacy of the Care Navigator platform. And this is a in this work is in progress. Uh, we, we, the Agency of Human Services staff, have had conversations with and collected information from delivery system users. We're also um, we are also looking at um, other uh, other tools that are available for um, coordinating care, uh, other health information um, exchange tools available for coordinating care. We're also we also know that One Care Vermont is um, is also evaluating Care Navigator as a as a platform, and we expect that along with the other recommendations here in this plan that are directed um, towards One Care Vermont specifically, that um, the work that they have been engaged in really seriously uh, since this, this improvement plan and consistent with the improvement plan, um, their strategic planning process, where our understanding is that um, One Care Vermont through stakeholder interviews, uh, strategic planning process, Will be, will be beginning to share the outcomes of their undertaking to really, um, to really answer the recommendations that are directed at them as, as the ACO that's participating in the all-payer model. So that does include the Care Navigator uh, evaluation. It also includes uh, One Care's elevation of data as a value-added product as well as how One Care um, focuses on its core business as a part of um, demonstrating value and providing um, for what we would want to see is additional uh, network participation. So like just uh, moving over, Wendy, um, is there anything you want to add about the Care Navigator evaluation at this time or? I think you can move ahead. I'll make a note in the sections I'm doing, but um, okay for now. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. The next recommendation, which is recommendation 14, AHS will condition provider participation. Will, and this is we will we will this is a, a longer term recommendation that in the context of the broader report describes how we could explore um, conditioning provider participation in the blueprint for health uh, PCMH payments on participation in a value-based payment arrangement with an ACO. We make this recommendation because it is our aim and objective as a state to shift more payment to value-based payment models when providers are participating in the in the blueprint for health but are not participating in value-based payment models there's a conflict there in what our state's overall objectives are um, again we're we're going to carefully explore tying PCMH payments to participation in value-based payment, but you are aware, I believe through the ACO budget process, it, you understand that um, with the Medicare increase that was, uh, that was provided through the model agreement, um, that that increase, that trend increase, and um, that we did direct that that trend increase could be used for um, CHT payments um, for those providers that are at risk um, in the in the payment model and are participating uh, with One Care Vermont. So we did take a small step towards tying um, tying uh, additional dollars in for Blueprint CHT to participation um, in a, in a value-based payment arrangement. And, and specifically, because those dollars are originating from the Medicare program, tying those dollars to Medicare participation in the model. Recommendation 15, AHS One Care Vermont and community providers should improve collaboration to strengthen integrated primary specialty and community-based care models for people with complex medical needs and medical and social needs, and to organize VCCI and Blueprint for Health in the Office of, the, uh, of Health Reform in the Secretary's Office. Um, VCCI is the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative. I'm going to ask Wendy to talk in more detail about this recommendation now. Thank you. Um, I'll note that uh, components of this recommendation are complete, uh, while others are still in process. So uh, VCCI and the Blueprint for Health are now organized within the Office of Healthcare Reform at AHS. Um, this is effective as of January 1, 2021. Um, so that's been implemented for several months now. Uh, within AHS, we're also approaching this recommendation through a number of lenses. Really, our first activity uh, is to create a comprehensive inventory of available case management and care coordination activities. This review is utilizing policy documents to define uh, factors such as eligible populations, the scope of focus of those activities, the scope of, um, of focus of the care coordination components, um, provider qualifications, the provider network, and payment approaches, among various other things. Uh, we're then going to be pairing this analysis with additional information that we want to collect from the field to understand really how these policies are impacting provider and individual and family experience. Uh, both of our learnings from these activities will inform our next steps. So we could um, do a number of activities such as eliminating barriers created by policy, implementing QI or training opportunities, or identifying opportunities for improvement through health information exchange. Um, so right now we're currently in the first phase of this activity, which is the policy analysis phase that I described in the beginning. I can move into recommendation 16. Um, that one is AHS, One Care Vermont, and community provider partners should identify a timeline and milestones for incorporating social determinants of health screening into the standard of care and health and human services settings. 
Uh, so here uh, at AHS, we are in the early phases of approaching this recommendation. Uh, like the previous recommendation, we're initially performing research on best practices related to social determinants of health screening and examining current policy and activities. Um, another activity that is related to this uh, that we're focused on, focused on is collaborating with OneCare on a grant they received from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called the Advancing Integrating Models or AIM grant. So through this grant, we're seeking to share AHS social determinants of health data with OneCare to support risk stratification activities. Uh, technical and legal or data gap governance activities are underway to support the activities of this grant. And then I just wanted to note uh, in alignment with the Care Navigator uh, recommendation you, you mentioned before, we appreciate that social determinants of health screening and navigation can be well supported through technology and health information exchange. Um, so as we're working on other recommendations like the evaluation of Care Navigator, we're also thinking about how care management tools and health information exchange can be effective tools in addressing health related social needs. And I'm going to pass it back to you for number 17. Thank you, Wendy. The recommendation number 17 is for the Agency of Human Services through the Blueprint for Health to jointly explore with OneCare Vermont and stakeholders the best available tools for capturing real-time patient feedback and to pilot such a methodology with willing primary care practices. This recommendation has really been made to get at one of the again, high level population health improvement goals in this model that we're all familiar with, which is to increase access to primary care. And by establishing a mechanism to understand more real time how patients in Vermont are experiencing primary care, that may give us an important lens um, into the impact of this model. And may also provide for uh, key um, data points where we can continue improving. Um, continuous improvement is very much a culture um, that must be fostered for us to be successful in payment and delivery system reform, especially as payment and delivery models are long-standing, multi-decade um, in which the healthcare system has been organized around fee-for-service reimbursement. This recommendation number 17 is um, specified as a longer term recommendation. And to the end, I can say we have not begun um, yet this process um, of looking at a real time um, patient feedback mechanism. I, we, we want to make some more progress and complete some of those recommendations that are framed as the shorter and medium term recommendations and time frame. We also recommended that AHS and the Green Mountain Care Board will prioritize regular stakeholder engagement opportunities. These opportunities I, I see as opportunities both to inform and improve the current model, as well as the necessary stakeholder engagement opportunities that will inform a potential future model and a potential uh, next, next agreement. These two things um, certainly do uh, intermix. They aren't entirely separate. However, we will frame different stakeholder engagement activities um, with, respect, with respect to these two objectives, both to improve in our current model as well as to look forward into informing a potential next agreement. To that end, and I'll, I'll come off of the I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see you now. Um, <laughs> to that end, we're looking at a time frame of really launching public engagement in the spring and summertime um, with the with the uh, conclusion of a of a busier time, um, certainly with the legislature in session, as well as uh, we hope to see um, as as well um, the case count in Vermont uh, hopefully start to decline with less of an impact of COVID-19 uh, directly on the partners that are all stakeholders in this, in this model. And I know that you referenced um, that as well in terms of your sustainability work. And it is, it is a challenge that presents 
itself with stakeholder engagement during this um, absolutely unprecedented time, but it's not one that we think is insurmountable by any means. In that process, I think it would be very helpful. We want to hear from, we want to hear from um, provider, payer, um, health system partner stakeholders about what is working with the all payer model agreement and analysis about what's not working and how that can inform a next agreement. We also think it's really important to get that perspective from the regulatory the regulatory body, which, which is you, and to be able to have um, a regular way to engage with you to understand from the regulatory perspective, from the uh, duties and requirements assigned to the Green Mountain Care Board, particularly in the agreement, um, what works what doesn't, what part of the agreement framework um, is is working, what part of the agreement framework can be improved, all in service of informing a, a next a next um, potential model agreement. So I assume that's the uh, conclusion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to open it up uh, to board members for comments and questions. And uh, um, so fire away, board members. I'll start. Thank you, Ina. Um, let me turn my camera on. I always forget to turn my camera on. I'm talking. Um, so I, I'm very interested in, in you kind of your last statement as to how we move forward. Um, you know, and, and I struggle as a board member, as you know, and I think some other board members do a bit too, in that we can't talk to each other about this stuff, you know, without uh, violating open meeting laws. And so, you know, it's kind of like, a, a, you know, some child's game where you're, or hit the pinata or whatever that, you know, where you can't see clearly. So there are some issues that, I mean, I don't want to talk about them today, but I do want to talk about, um, I could be totally, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know um, on a, uh, uh, in, in a, a path that doesn't make sense or, but these are things that have kind of, you know, um, I've settled on in my mind that are important um, in terms of moving this forward. Uh, one, one would be, and I'll just list them and, and move on, one would be that the timeline of any extension, I think, clearly has to accommodate this pandemic. Um, it's just been so disruptive, you know, that we've got to get to a point where the dust is settled and, and uh, you know, people uh, can, can clearly lift their heads and, and look forward. Um, but I also worry about reform fatigue, you know, and that, that, so say we have another year to just, you know, of the current agreement to, um, <clears throat> accommodate the pin pandemic and then add another four years on to that. And, uh, you know, I, I know that one of the early paragraphs of the current model, it's described as a test, you know, that all this infrastructure that we put in place is a test. The ACO is a test. The uh, risk agreements are a test um, and to see if this model will work. And, but I think as you get farther down the road to a eight to 10 year time frame it begins to look more like, you know, a bureaucracy kind of establishing itself independent of whether it's successful or not. So that's, you know, I, I you know, my, my instinct now is that a one year extension of the current agreement for what it's worth and a two to three year, you know, ad additional, you know, time period to, to land this airplane. Uh, you know, we do have a lot of the infrastructure in, you know, we have the, the ACO agreement, we have value-based contracts, um, we have some FPP, but certainly not enough, and we have a quality infrastructure. So all of those important foundational elements, you know, have matured a little bit. They're certainly not mature, but but they're up and running. So that would be one. Um, another uh, that I'd like to talk about is FPP. You know, and and you mentioned that in item number eight, and I'm just finding that important. We. You know, went through the hospital budget process uh, this year for 
2022 and um, hospitals on average had a 14.5% FPP of, of, of their NPR. And, um, um, and the, but in the range was 6% to 23%. Um, from the 23 percenter, we have a great report down at um, South <clears throat> Southern Vermont Hospital, who I don't know if you saw that Digger article maybe a month ago, but it was just kind of basically saying that the reform approach is really working down there. So, um, but as a, as a regulator, I kind of want to know what the goal line is, where, where is the critical, uh, critical point where the decapitation elements of FPP generate um, innovation. And I, I don't think it's at 14% or 6%. Some of the staff tell me it's maybe at starting at, a, at 30%, 35%, but it would just be nice to have that in the model as a goal so that we know what we're working for and, and it, it, it backstops us in the regulatory process. Um, Another uh, would be the cost shift, your favorite topic. <laughs> um, but I, I do see the cost shift being kind of a chronic disease of this system that, you know, for 2021, uh, the DIVA folks went into the emergency board and basically said, we're not giving any reimbursement increases this year except for those federally mandated. And so I worry that let's just be make the assumption that, that the model is working and, and providers are becoming more efficient you know, that there that that effort gets undermined and siphoned off through the cost shift. And so, you know, I, I know the cost shift is never going to be fixed. It's too big a number. I probably had some part in creating it at one point in my life. I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it to me, it's it's a it's a chronic disease within the system. And and I hear from providers, especially the independent provider, that um, it just sucks the life out of them. And uh, so here we are trying to build our our, our core of primary care physicians, and uh, they just feel like they're a gerbil on a treadmill, and um, it's 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 not moving in a direction, you know that that I think can go on. And so even some minor kind of approach that said, put, and especially with caseloads dropping. I mean, Dr. Dinosaur, for example, the kid counts in our school system are down 21% over the last 15 years. Um, and uh, it looks like the caseload on a lot of the Medicaid programs um, are at least flatlined uh, 20, uh, 21, 22 to the data that's on the emergency board. And so if, if folks could come up with a, a one or two percent strategy, you know, one percent of new money, which is five million bucks for a percent increase in reimbursement rates, according to that section of the law that that uh, requires them to report that to the emergency board and a one percent from efficiencies. and you know, you can you can always find at least one percent of an efficiency in in your systems. You can always find it. So um, so so some something where people, when we go through the hospital budget process, many hospitals don't even put an increase in for Medicaid. That, I mean, it's become such an ingrained assumption that it's zero year to year. Um, and I, I just think that 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 is wrong. And finally, um, an issue that I think we've discussed before. You know, is this benchmark plan? Um, it's very clear that that the benchmark plan preceded the all pair model, and that there is not a tight alignment with the population health goals in in the um, uh, all pair model and how the benchmark plan is structured. But I worry that we uh, and uh, my fellow board members warned me of this, and I also and I see it unfolding, is that we open up the benchmark plan. And it just becomes a grab bag for additional benefits. And there's a bill that is in the House that's doing just that. Um, it says, you know, it's basically putting the cost of this new benefit onto premiums and onto Medicaid or onto the Medicaid cost shift. And I, I just, I just think that, uh, you know, that that timing on that isn't right. Is that we could just, we should simply align the benchmark plan with the all pair model goals, for example, pre-diabetes, you know, uh, there is no organized focus in the benchmark plan for pre-diabetes, but we have a great plan, you know, um, in terms of the blueprint working. Um, and, you know, so they have a program that is totally independent of the benchmark plan. So that alignment's important, but if it's just going to be a way to, again, taking the efficiencies that might be found in the benchmark plan 
and using them to uh, in a way that's inconsistent with with the goals of the all pair model, um, which include capitation um, and the reforms that come from that, then it, it just seems like we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, so those are kind of the areas that uh, that roll around in my mind and um, helpful or not, I thought I'd put them on the table. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Other board members? I'm happy to go next or if unless ahead, somebody else wants to jump in. Okay. Hi, Ina and Wendy. Nice to see you. Thank for thank you for joining us and giving us an update. Um, I did have a couple of questions um, related to the improvement plan. Um, first of all, Wendy, your the your discussion around some of the care management. Uh, inventory stuff. I just wanted to make sure that you, I'm sure you are aware that there'd been a ton of work done in the SIM program. And so I'm hopeful that some of that work you'll be able to build off of and that you won't have to recreate the wheel. So just wanted to mention that just in case. Um, so that's good. And I'm, I'm interested to, I'll be interested to hear what comes out of the Care Navigator um, conversation we did include in our ACO budget order um, sort of an update with our staff in terms of demos on the tools which was how we looked at them in the initial certification process um, so I think it'll be interesting to to see your analysis as well because that's certainly something that we look at in certification and budget um, Hold on just one second. I'm just looking back at the plan to remind myself what else I had for questions. Um, in terms of, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the fixed perspective payments. So I think, um, speaking for myself, I do think looking at ways to move forward on fixed perspective payments in the Medicare program in a different way than they're currently structured makes sense. And so, um, you know, I don't think we as a board have, we've talked about fixed perspective payments and certainly emphasized how that appears to be a payment model um, that allows for greater delivery system change momentum. Um, but I, for one, would love to see at the staff level um, some work with our folks and your folks moving forward on developing what that might look like. There are I think different issues with Medicare than with Medicaid. And so I'm not sure if an exact mirror makes sense. Um, I really need to understand, uh, as you both probably know, I'm a detail person, so I like to understand the nuances. So, but it seems to me that if we, if the parties to the all pair model agreement agree that that's an area that we want to explore, that perhaps at the staff level that could get going because Certainly December is right around the corner. So that was something I wanted to throw out um, both for you guys, but also for my fellow board members in terms of um, having that discussion, because I think that there could be some fruit there. Um, and then in the commercial sector, I think as you know, um, included in the uh, provider reimbursement report options that we included, that we uh, were asked to do by the uh, legislature, we did include some um, regulatory options which could further uh, moving towards fixed perspective payments in the commercial sector. Now, those are regulatory. They're not provider-led or voluntary type models because it, it is a regulatory system by its nature. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because I think there are, uh, there are your recommendation, which makes sense given the current authority, at least that we have, that this be a conversation makes sense to me. And certainly moving away from a provider led model is a big shift. So um, I'm not suggesting that we're ready for that. I'm just indicating that I think that there's different ways to look at that. And I think that um, certainly, as you may or may not know, we routinely ask in both rate review and hospital budgets around about the commercial sector and get. Uh, updates on the Blue Cross pilot with Southwestern on how that's going. So 
uh, that's another area of interest to me as well. Um, those were the things at, at top of mind. I'll look back through my notes while other folks talk and uh, let you know if I have anything else. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Other members of the board? Yeah, hi, Ina. Hi, Wendy. Uh, just want to first of all, just thank you again for the updates. And it sounds like some um, important progress has been made, which is impressive given all of the other distractions and other important issues that we're trying to deal with with COVID. So it's good to see some of that progress. Um, and I appreciated you know, your remarks at the end about the process going forward with as we think about a possible next uh, agreement with the federal government, having some stakeholder engagement and having an opportunity for regulators to to weigh in. We certainly have a different perspective than maybe other stakeholders might. We see things you know, through our lens and it would be helpful to be able to have that conversation this summer at some point, if it sounds like that's when it might be. Um, I wanted to just ask you a little bit more about, um, and maybe this is a little bit of building on Robin's question around her interest in the self-funded and commercial uh, plans and their some of the obstacles to fixed payment that, that you might have uncovered in some of your conversations or your learnings. Um, just wondering if there's anything more you might be able to share or dig deeper into that with us a little bit as we're heading into rate review season and other types of our own regulatory processes. Are there any learnings that you have that you could share with us that might inform our conversations going forward? I think as, as you and um, your, st your staff are familiar and we've worked together on this in, in the past that um, when there are plans that are not directly regulated um, by the, such as self-funded plans that aren't subject um, to the same types of state regulation that a fully insured plan is, is subject to, then the, the tools for, um, for, for garnering that participation are more limited, right? There isn't that regulatory approach that Robin just referenced um, that could potentially be in place for the fully funded commercial plans. So that remains a barrier. I think one of the aims in the implementation improvement plan is to do education and outreach to those self-funded groups um, that are not participating at this time. And as I mentioned, we've, we've um, managed that with the state employee plan. We still have more work to do in terms of communication and outreach. And I think that that's the, the um, a most immediate tool. I do think that it's another important conversation that we can um, convene perhaps with our partners at the Department of Financial Regulation to understand better um, the totality of, of potential influence um, that, that there could be. At the same time, acknowledging um, what Robin's comments as well, or Board Member Lunge's comments as well, um, that that you know that's that is maybe not something we're fully ready for moving from voluntary to mandatory, and I think that that's going to be a conversation that um, comes up a lot as we look at what works and what doesn't work in this current agreement and how we approach the next. And that's one that I think um, we'll have to have um, in in forums like this and in other forums as well. I, I also wanted to say, um, as we continue these conversations, you also have key data and information that can inform the conversations, like the information that Elena was presenting earlier uh, prior in this meeting. Um, I think that there, the information that will become available regarding the sustainability planning and what your consultant is gathering um, from the field could be very informative too as we think about um, what's working, what's not working, and how to look at a future um, potential agreement. Sounds good, thank you, Ina. Okay, other members of the board? Um, yeah, first, uh, thank you for the presentation and all the work you've been doing behind this. Um, when you look at the um, APM improvement activities and the things that are still open. Um, which ones concern you? Are there are there specific ones that you're concerned about? You know, as far as progress or timing or 
you know, you're getting cooperation from all the partners and I don't know that it's a it's necessarily concern, but the area of significant focus is in that prospective um, payment model modeling and and in uh, working with CMMI in how we approach that. I want to yeah, I want to have conversations with them too about that and what that looks like. Again, um, board member Lunge raises a good point that there might be some differences in in how that looks for Medicare. Well, we have expertise from our our Medicaid program in in providing and running this payment model. I think those are learnings that we can share directly with our partners at CMMI, so that they can then respond based on um, their experience with the Medicare program, their ability um, to potentially um, put in place um, alternative models to the current. Um, Medicare payment model, which does include that reconciliation component that is ultimately uh, reinforcing some of those fee-for-service incentives. Okay, good. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Does anyone else from the board have anything further before I turn it over to the public for public comment? Kevin, I thought I'd just jump back in on uh, 9 and 10, um, which were the recommendations to us. Yeah. Um, before I do that, I think like on the FPP, I do think we should have a better idea of what we as a state is the want as the right direction. Not that we shouldn't share our information, our you know what we feel like we've learned with CMS around Medicaid, but I do think it's important prior to going into a negotiation to have kind of that state uh, perspective clearly before we start to accidentally negotiating against ourselves. So that would just be my two cents on kind of trying to move forward with that uh, analysis sooner than later. Um, on uh, nine and 10, so I'm going to start with 10, which is the ACO cost growth drivers, which is something that I think we have been working on in the ACO program for a couple of years now. So um, we did include in our 2021 reporting manual uh, these sorts of information, and also in 2020, we got some reporting. So I do think that we, I'll just speak for myself, I guess, I think that we are interested in getting a clearer sense of um, connecting all those dots from the provider level through the ACO and payer level. Um, in terms of the the using the ACO and hospital budget process to look at um, ACO participants moving towards their different sorts of compensa physician compensation. Um, I, I, we did actually hear a little bit about that in the hospital budget process a few years ago. Um, of course, last year and this year, we're doing a much more streamlined process because of COVID. And so certainly I, I, this you had listed as a longer term suggestion. Um, and certainly like this is not the year for us to be doing that. But I think we do, we certainly don't have the ability to do a contractual kind of review, but um, in terms of our staff resourcing, but for me, I think it would be, I would be interested in hearing more from hospitals in the longer term future about how they're thinking about connecting all of the dots on their end. Um, and I I don't know that we have really, like I, to me, it might be a step too far to be putting requirements, but again, this is a longer term thought process. So that's just my thoughts on uh, nine and 10. Thank you, Robin. Anything further from the board? If not, is there members of the public who wish to offer public comment? I saw a hand go up. Um, Ham Davis. I've got a couple of questions. Um, can you hear me okay, Kevin? We can. Thank you. We, we get a great um, shot of your computer, the Dell. It's a fancy computer. I'm very fond of uh, is, uh, one of the most interesting developments in the last few weeks here has been the announcement that they're going to that they want to be go, go into business with MVP to deliver to uh, offer 
starting in the fall, offer a um, Medicare Advantage plan. Question: The first one, Dean, I'd like to ask is, I, I, my understanding is that if if that the uh, you, that you cannot that that uh, uh, people in a Medicare Advantage plan can't be attributed to the ACO. Is that true? No, I don't think that that is categorically true. I think that an ACO can could work with a Medicare Advantage plan and could enter into an arrangement that would be a, a qualifying scale target initiative within the current agreement framework. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not, so, but is it conventional? Is it a conventional uh, attribution in the way that we do it now, or is it something different? I mean, right now, what we have is we have a, well, what happened, primary to take his patients and attribute those patients to the ACO. Is that right? Is that how we get attributed now? I think you said primary care. Yeah. For we have a, mo we have a model in the in the Northeast that looked at at using at using a uh, as a trial as a pilot using um, using hot just the hospital connect. It's bypassing the primary care, but that's just the pilot. The rest of the people that are attributed to One Care Vermont, as we speak, I believe, have all been put there by their primary care physician. Is that wrong? The primary care is primary care providers participation in the in the ACO. Yes, is is the factor that attributes many of the many of the attributed lives. Well, I mean, who would do the rest of them? It's not, it's not all. If many, not all. Is there, is, there, is there some other way active in the state now to attribute people to one care? Yes, the Medicaid program does have an alternative attribution methodology that is not based on an individual's primary care provider when that individual does not have a does not have a primary care provider established okay, thank you my, the other question i was not not a, a fact question if you would uh the one of the from from the last in the last several years one of the major questions on scale and on the on the question of how well the whole system works at the really where the rubber hits the road which is whether we when we start to save money on people on on the prospective payment systems the question has been uh, we have Medicaid in there. We have we don't have Medicare in there, and we and most important, we have had very little or, or none actual fee, uh, prospect fixed payment contracts with Blue Cross. What is you? What do you? What does the state administration believe? How do you assess the uh, the potential effect of the UVM uh, 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 manage the, the uh, you know, the Medicare Advantage plan. Do you have an assessment of that? I don't have an assessment of that plan at this time. As I said, I think there there is a potential that the plan um, could collaborate with an ACO in order to provide population health management that would allow the plan to uh, work, work and perform better within um, its cost targets, but but I, the, that's as much as I can say at this time. Thank you. Okay, Mort Wasserman. Thanks, so the mute button's off. So I had, uh, first I was very gratified to see mentioned in the implementation improvement plan of social determinants of health. But I was uh, a little puzzled about the emphasis on screening for it. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, Ina Backus and Wendy Trafton about how the Agency of Human Services, which is sitting on incredible amounts of data about social determinants of health, whether it's 
Department of Children and Families for child care assistance or corrections, housing needs, uh, medical transportation, information about substance abuse, information about disabilities. What the agency itself is doing to integrate those data and pass them on to community agencies or healthcare providers. We we are focused on integrating those data uh, in a stepwise process into the health information exchange. We are prioritizing first integrating claims and clinical data in the health information exchange. Next, uh, focusing on what we believe um, because of changes at the federal level, we will be able to incorporate uh, mental health and substance use disorder data into the health information exchange. And then from, and then the next um, area of focus is to include uh, social determinants of health data in the health information exchange. Those data being the ones um, in part that you named that are um, existing now uh, within the agency of, of human services. The, the focus on the screening for social determinants of health is, is one wherein we are promoting that um, within patient center and medical home setting, um, that, those, that those social determinants of health are being potentially identified if there are um, barriers to health and well-being that are social determinants that those be identified. But I think it's really important to say that we want to pair that recommendation with the work that we are beginning um, with our Blueprint for Health team, as well as um, our Chronic Care Initiative team, as well as working with the broader agency of human services and the programs and services existing there that are available to address the social determinants of health when there is an identified need. And so the idea being to bridge the, to bridge the medical and social services care continuum, but in not just building a, a bridge um, for the sake of building a bridge, but ensuring that once you cross that bridge, that system to address the social determinants of health is as strong, integrated, and well-functioning as it can be. Thank you. Okay, next I'm going to go to Dale Hackett. Dale? Ina, could you just clarify when you were talking about the um, attribution of life if you're in Medicare, if you are a dual and you're Medicaid and Medicare, could you could you include that as well? Because that often gets left out as far as a population. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. If you are an individual who is duly eligible for the Medicaid and Medicare programs, you will be and and your primary care provider is participating uh, with One Care Vermont, you will be attributed to One Care Vermont as a Medicare beneficiary. Okay, other public comment or questions? Hearing none, um, one final question, Nina. Um, how do you and Wendy feel the improvement plan is going? And um, are there concerns, uh, areas that concern you that you don't think are moving um, as fast as you had hoped? I, again, I'm I'm not going to go as, as so far as to say concerned, but I am um, also uh, very anxious for um, for the time where we can um, 
know that our federal partners have settled in their leadership um, and in their new in, within their new administration, um, and th and that we can really get to the table with them to be having some um, conversations about what we've proposed specifically in this implementation improvement plan. So it's, it's not a concern, but it is a place where I know um, I'd like to get to more quickly. Um, but I also would fully expect that this is a, a fully expected transition time. Um, we would anticipate that during the transition time that, um, you know, there's a little bit of a change in, in, in um, our, our partnership um, and, and important, and as we all know, the, the global health pandemic does, um, does create some additional drag on transition times because there's so much effort um, that's happening to try to address the immediacy of, of the public health emergency. But I'm not concerned at this time. I'm just a little anxious and, and excited. I think we all have that anxiety. <laughs> so with that, um, I wish to thank you and Wendy for um, a great uh, update on the uh, implementation plan. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you to um, try to be as successful as we possibly can be. So um, thank you both for your uh, efforts on behalf of the state. With that, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Kevin, I just have one thing I wanted to mention about uh, a brief update on the prescription drug tag, which I know that Susan would be great has a scheduled meeting on Monday. So the group decided at its last meeting that we're gonna shift to, and by we, I actually mean the group members, not me, um, are gonna shift to a subgroup structure to try and um, kind of focus and and accelerate some of the policy development work, which is proving challenging in, the lar in trying to do that with a big group. Um, so we may uh, end up canceling Monday's meeting if um, it looks like members want to just jump right into their subgroups and start cranking through the work. So um, I just thought I would mention that to the board that that's a shift. We'll still have monthly meetings of the full group to get reports in from the subgroups and as soon as proposals are ready to fully vet them through that larger group. But I think that may help us move forward a little bit more quickly. That's great, Robin. Thank you. Okay, um, any other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, would someone wish to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Robin and seconded by Tom to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.